6,000 changes <laughs> in one file. And it turned out that the, the file that was changed was one that I was doing some pretty, pretty serious refactoring. And when I tried to merge this change in, I got piles and piles of merge conflicts. And this really shocked me, because I wasn't expecting it. And after several attempts of trying to resolve the merge conflicts, that, shock, that initial shock became a really intense frustration. I was frustrated with the tooling available to try and resolve these merge conflicts. And frankly, the only changes that happened were basically spacing. So I was really upset by this. And I felt lost. So I silently rage quit this project. And I put a fairly significant amount of part-time, kind of spare time work over the past year or two. And I didn't tell anyone that I would just give it up. I had lost hope, I went away to do other things. And I, I'm reasonably certain that um, looking back, I did not know and find the author of this commit and say, hey, I was working on that. Can we back out that change? I don't know why I didn't ask, but I, I, just, I just didn't. I just quit instead, which was not a good choice. But uh, I, I think the, the lesson I learned from this is that shock can, quit, can very quickly turn into a feeling of hopelessness or helplessness, and you feel all alone. And essentially, I threw a tantrum and quit, and that was the end of that, over, over something that could have been fixed. And this was a mistake, right? It was, it was not my best move. I, I, I'm, I hope that I've matured significantly since, since those six or eight years ago, but um, it's, it's still an important lesson to me that, that, that I, I try and learn from. And that has influenced um, the, the sort of the style guide recommendations we have in the Logstash project. There's a semi-formal style guide for how to write code for Logstash, but one of the blurbs in the first paragraph is, is telling you, if you send me a patch and it doesn't match the style guide, whatever, it's fine. We're not going to reject it because you don't program the same way I do. Functionally speaking, I think software style, programming style, should be something that, that tooling can fix. And one particular project, uh, the, the Go language, does this very well. Go ships with a tool called Go Format. Takes your code, formats it the way someone described, and you don't have to write your code in the same way to have it output in the desired uh, default format, which is really, really great. If you don't have tooling to fix this, you end up with style guide recommendations that are massive essays, 40, 50 pages of text to tell you how to format certain things, which function kinds of calls you shouldn't be making, how you should phrase things, how you should any character space. It's like, we have computers to solve this kind of nonsense. Let's go ahead and use them. And the Go project has done that. And I find that's actually really useful in helping enforce style. There's, there's a lot of opinions on how you should style, but I think there's, there's two different things. One is, you know, you should program the way I do, which we can argue about. And there's, there's another one that you should have consistent style so that all the, all the code is readable. And I think that um, Go and some other projects now lately are, are coming up with tooling to help you enforce this, which is very nice. Because now you're having a computer help you do things instead of having to fight other humans about your particular interpretations of the style guide. So the next story I want to talk about is uh, how to gather all the feedback. And I couldn't find a concrete example of this, but uh, the gist is that when you go to file a bug report with a project, oftentimes it will be closed for having not enough detail, or they, they come back and tell you, please write this massive essay with a huge amount of details describing exactly your problem, how to reproduce it, and exactly what you would expect instead of what you actually got. And usually when I see this kind of request, I'm like, all right, I don't care. I don't have enough time or energy to dedicate into figuring all of this stuff out for you. I really want to work with you on reporting this bug, but I simply don't have the energy to dedicate to building this massive body of work to prove that a bug exists. So the lesson I take from that is don't do things that exhaust your users. And I, I heavily encourage people in the Logstash community to file literally all of the bugs. 
I actually encourage this. And even if the description of a problem is, I saw something weird, I say file it all again. If you saw something weird today, chances are three weeks from now, someone other than you will find the exact same weirdness. And when they type that weirdness into a search engine, they're going to find your bug and they can add their data. And after enough users have run across this problem, we should have enough context to figure out what went wrong. And now, by investing very small amounts of energy from multiple individuals, we've come up with a very strong bug report instead of relying on one person spending a whole bunch of time trying to figure out exactly how a problem happened. And you're probably not going to get a good quality bug report. Another thing I want to talk about is some documentation successes. So one of the things I think we did very well with Logstash was keeping the documentation close to the code. Most of the documentation for the Logstash project, again, documentation is for humans. Uh, most of the documentation is written inside the code itself, much like you would see with uh, JavaDoc or PyDoc or RubyDoc. And in that way, we, uh, we in, it kind of implicitly encourages that whenever you change the functionality of a given part of Logstash, the comment describing the behavior that you're changing is right above, and you update that, and the documentation is updated to reflect that. So I think that was something we did very well. A real-world example of keeping documentation close to the, the executing object is if you are, if you open the hood of your car, for example. Pieces that are intended to be kind of user serviceable or owner serviceable are pretty clearly labeled. If you want to know where to put uh, washer fluid, you look for the thing that looks like a windshield being washed, and you open the cabinet next to that. Right? That's the documentation next to really close to the thing that you need to service. One other thing I think we did well, but it's always a challenge, is versioning your documentation. It's, it's almost a punishment to users if you don't do this. If you only have whatever is the latest version of documentation online, someone who deploys today will have incorrect documentation tomorrow, which is not good. And you're going to end up with people who are upset. We'll talk about how to resolve those upset situations later. But we also messed up documentation. So, as it stands, through the history of the past, I think, five years of the project, documentation has always been tied to a specific release. So, when we do a release of Logstash, we produce the thing you download, which is Logstash, and we produce the list of files that is the documentation. And they are released at the same time, and always together. And we don't have any tooling, uh, at, least until, at least for now, to allow us to fix what we, what we consider bugs in the documentation. If there's a small typo or we made some formatting problems, the next time we're really able to fix any kind of bugs in the documentation is in the next release, which is kind of lame, uh, and, and, and I don't like that. Um, it also has a problem that, uh, we, that, that would encourage you if you find major documentation faults to fix all of the bugs in the documentation and then immediately do what you might consider a bug fix release where literally none of the code has changed, but the documentation is the only thing that's changed. So it's difficult and it's something that we're still struggling with, but I think in my mind it's still a failing. The next thing I want to talk about is contribution successes. So one thing that um, is very difficult with, uh, I have found with, uh, especially with online te technology communities is that most of the communication is text-based. With text, you have almost no information. There's no body language. There's no verbal cues. There's no you know, context on how, how, how far away the person is from you, how they're sitting, how, how their voice is inflecting, how loud they're talking, where their eyes are going, do they look bored, do they look excited or upset. And so my, my suggestion for a lot of this is to sort of break out of text communication wherever possible. I think this, in, in a way, is, is the reason for animated GIFs making a sort of resurgence in, in terms of communications, or emoji making, a, making a, a, a big surge recently, is that text is kind of boring. Uh, text is, is, is difficult to, to have sort of these implied things if, if I say something sarcastically in person, that will, that will, the sarcasm will be made clear in my facial expressions and the tone of my voice. 
But in text, it looks like I'm presenting something as fact that you think is completely silly, and then we might fight. Right? So because there's no, for example, Unicode character for I am being sarcastic, I think it's very valuable to break out of these situations and use video or pictures or audio. In this particular case, uh, this is me saying looks good to me on a pull request on GitHub. Right? Rather than typing, you know, looks good to me, please merge, I simply just take a quick picture with my webcam and we're good to go. Obviously, if you're not comfortable with this, that's totally fine. There are other options than simply taking a picture of your face. You can post a picture of a cat for all that really matters. But um, I think the, the, the most important point I would say out of this is break away from uh, plain text. There's been some contribution failures, I think. One of them recently is that I'm haunted by a number. And in my mind, it's a very large number that, in my, that I believe, you know what it is, that I believe should be very small. And uh, I, it haunts me because I take it as a personal failing. And that's this number. This is the number of open pull requests on GitHub for Logstash. It's over 200 patches waiting for someone to come along and review it, give feedback, and merge it. This number to me is very large. It haunts me because it, I feel like this number should be low. Because for some reason I believe that a high number is some kind of indication that we're not actively engaging with this particular part of the community of folks who are contributing code to Logstash. And I feel bad. Right? But I, functionally, in, in, in my head, I feel bad on the other side of my brain. I know there's only so many hours in the day. And we have to choose the kinds of things that we work on. And sometimes it's not reviewing code that comes in from the community. So I don't know exactly how to fix this, but um, it's something we're very aware of. Another story I want to talk about is asking for help. And this, this comes from uh, my experience in dealing with open, other open source communities where you, you show up as basically an outsider and you ask for help. And you, maybe you join the IRC channel and you're like, hey everyone, this project is amazing. I'm trying to do X, Y, Z, and it's not working. And the first response is, why are you doing that? Right? And I'm shocked when I ask that question. I'm like, I'm, I, I wasn't aware I needed to fill you in on why I'm here in the universe doing my thing. I was just like, I, I'm trying to use this piece of software that I thought was cool in this community for the software, and it's not doing the thing I wanted. And then the next response is, well, you shouldn't do it that way. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> and then in, in my mind, like, I, I will, I, my, my general pattern of speech is the, to use hyperbolic a lot. I try to avoid that in, in, when I talk. But in my head, I hear very quickly, everything about your life is wrong. <laughs> First, I was trying to print to some weird printer on Linux, and I asked the printing people for help, and they insist that my life is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that this is simply a failure of communication, like the, the rational part of my brain. But the irrational part of my brain is like, I was just trying to print. Why? Like, I have, I'm having a crisis of, of existence here. What is happening? So this only gets worse when you start asking the internet. You're no longer asking simply a bunch of active humans, you're asking the internet. So you go to the internet and you ask it, how do I do this thing that I am trying to do? And it's awesome! Like, the first hit is literally what you typed. And it's on Stack Overflow and you're like, boom, I'm going to get the answer. This is the best day. What? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I literally typed how something which makes it a question. It is closed as not a real question. N not a real question. What does that even mean? <laughs> and if you look at the small text, it tells you why it thinks it's not a real question. But I, I stopped reading of not a real question. Who is this person I don't know closing it as not a real question? And oftentimes, and this is, this is not to say Stack Overflow is bad, I don't want to harp on that, but um, this is a fantastic site. And oftentimes you get ganged up on, right? You haven't even asked the question, you just type something into a search engine. But sometimes this closes not a real question, but like six people. 
Because then they'll ask you versus these six people trying to argue about the existence of your actual question. It's so it's confusing. And we'll get to what, what the word real, real means shortly. I, I don't, what does that mean? It's not a real question. So I have an existential crisis. If my question is not real, am I real? What does this, what does life even mean? How can I go from typing a question into a search engine and finding the first hit being the actual thing I ask and it's closed by seven people, not a real question? Ah. Alright, so the lesson learned from that is words matter. And actually, if you go to the Stack Overflow site, there's a lot of ongoing sort of meta discussions about whether the word real was the best choice. And they're, they're actively working on that. And I very much applaud that community for being kind of proactive and recognizing that words matter and people stop reading after you call them on saying the, the question is not real. So words really, 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 really matter. This is especially important uh, for a number of reasons. Most importantly, that the Earth is round, and there are a lot of people on this big blob in space that their, their primary language is not English. My, my, my native language is English. My wife's native language is English. We often communicate poorly, and we've been together for 12 years. I, 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 I can't expect reasonably from that that two strangers meeting on the internet with text-only communication will communicate perfectly at first chance. So words very much matter. <laughs> I'm an ex-schooler. I worked there in between 2006 and 2007-ish. And one of the things that, uh, reflecting on having worked there that really bothers me was this kind of phrase of saying that that's ungoogly. And it was this weird cultural term, and, and I think no one really knew what it meant, but they threw it around. I, I think the in, in my head, this word is kind of an illusion. It, it, it was it was said with well intended, with, with, with good intentions, but I, I I personally never heard it used in a way that I I felt was good. I always felt I was being admonished when I heard it. And I often found it meant that one individual was disagreeing with something you were doing, whether it was a technical design decision or whether it was a, per, uh, a certain behavior you had at the office. And they were phrasing it by putting the entire company against you. Right? Instead of saying, I disagree with you because X, because of reasons, maybe more than one, that would be great, and we can talk about the reasons. They're saying, the entire company disagrees with what you're doing right now. <laughs> you want to copy a file from host A to B using this program? The entire company hates you. <laughs> really? So you see this outside of the little microverse that is Google, and you, and you see it in the form of phrases like, that's an anti-pattern. And you'll see other things like, it's, um, that's not idiomatic. Oh, what does that even mean? Just tell me why you don't like the thing that I'm doing. You personally, don't tell me, don't speak on behalf of a body of a population that you don't actually represent. Just tell me what you think about what I'm doing. And then I can make a decision based on that information of whether I should alter my course. Right? So anti pattern is another word that takes an individual opinion and kind of projects it on a wall and makes you think, you the receiver, think that it's actually everyone hates you. Like, your ideas are bad and you should feel bad. Everyone thinks that. It's not good. Just say, I feel your decision will impact blah because of reasons. Right? Much easier. Instead of dismissing the person and saying, oh, that's a bad idea, you shouldn't do that, or you can't do that, that's impossible. I, I hear that a lot. I think that's impossible. It's kind of a weird one because we have these fantastic machines that can do amazing computations and basically execute whatever you tell them to do, which is almost anything. And it's impossible. It's a computer. We can make new stuff. So my recommended sentence structure is, is this. You say, I believe something because reasons. And you might find that many people do not communicate this way. That's okay. I have a tool for you. 
this works especially great for text-based communication. Someone, someone makes a statement to you like that's ungoogly, you just simply put in front of it, I believe that. And now instead of someone, someone's uh, words being read by your brain as some kind of fact, you're reading it as an opinion. And that sort of softens it and makes it less likely for, or at least me, to like sort of go off the rails and, and we'll have, instead of discussing the technical problem that we're talking about that is being labeled bad or anti-pattern, then we end up getting distracted with what the real definition of anti-pattern means. Like, no, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about whatever thing, this technical decision we're talking about. So communication matters quite a bit. And terminology matters, and this gets more into documentation specifically. So early versions of Logstash had this thing for plugins called status. And status had labels. Those labels were English words, experimental, beta, and stable. You see this with um, Debian, for example, which has unstable, testing, and stable. I don't know what those mean. I have definitions for what stable, unstable, and testing means, but I'm sure Debian differs. And actually, what I've learned is Logstash made a mistake here. We shouldn't have used English words. Even when I provided a glossary for what I meant and what Logstash meant by these labels, nobody reads this. What we were finding was that plugins that were labeled beta or plugins that were labeled experimental were simply completely ignored. Because people would see that the status was experimental and go, I'm not touching that. But if you read the documentation, the, the text here, by the way, is not meant to be readable. The point is that here's a visual of it being documented. But uh, it wasn't a good choice. Now we use numbers. So instead of having this thing called plugin status, we use a number system that's one, two, three, that's sortable. And we have the definitions that are roughly the same as the definitions are now, except we're not using a, a, a single term that people already have this kind of predefined word definition for it. Right? I'm not going to... This page tries to change your definition of the word experimental. It tries to change your definition of the word beta. And that's, that's a losing proposition for documentation. Because now the, that person has to carry around in their head what the context of Logstash beta plugin and Logstash experimental plugin means. So another, another story I'm going to talk about is stress. And humans get stressed. I get stressed. I was nervous all day or waiting for this presentation to happen. And I resolved that stress by endlessly poking at my presentation until it was time to present. But uh, there's lots of stressors. You have stressors in your life, in your work, and it throws everyone off. You end up losing sleep due to endless, an endless stream of 3 a.m. technology failures, or a constant pressure of delivery deadlines with management and your executive team saying, when's that product going to be ready? Because we already you know, committed to it being released. There's day-to-day -day tools failing. I can't tell you the number of uh, times I've wanted to flip a table over because something in Vim didn't work the way I wanted it to, despite my having 10 years of experience with Vim, and I know it's not going to do the thing that I wanted to do, even though I try and make it. Commuting is a stress. Your, your out-of-work life experiences are stressful. Relationships and parenting and other responsibilities are stressful. Bills are stressful. All of that can manifest itself in completely unrelated aspects of your life. And I, and I don't think the community should be your psychologist, but it can help in other ways. Right? So I observe stress from in, in others when, when someone joins the Logstats IRC channel and they're very upset and they're very angry. Specifically, they're angry about Logstats. It has ruined their day, ruined their week, or they've spent six hours banging their head on a problem. And most frequently, I have found that their problem with Logstash really was simply just the last straw. Right? They were on, they were at the boiling point, and like a small thing they couldn't figure out in Logstash just made it explode. And that's okay, because humans are like that. We need to accept that that happens. And what I found in some communities is, or my experience in some communities is that. These, these people enter as sort of outsiders, and they're basically setting everything on fire, and people just shove them out or ignore them and they go away. And it, it's not helping anything. We'll talk about how to turn this around shortly. But um, in, in, in my mind, the, the Logstash community doesn't exist simply to answer uh, or, or, or direct users at technical support. Sometimes before offering technical support, you need 
need to offer emotional support, right? You've got to empathize with the person and bring them back to being a normal, rational human. When they're in a, in, in a rational, heightened, you know, upset, panicked state, pointing them at a wall of documentation and telling, to, telling them RTFM is not going to help them. So there's, a, there's quite a bit of prior work in managing um, what, what is called often as a behavioral crisis um, and strategies for uh, what is called de-escalation for helping someone go from this sort of irrational behavioral crisis state back to being a rational person and then you can talk to them and help, help them solve the problem. So it's really a two-step process. One is talking them down, getting them to stop setting things on fire, getting them to realize that they are not alone, that they have humans in this world who are willing to help them with this particular problem, and then actually helping them solve that problem. It's very important that that's a two-step process. Right? I talked earlier about uh, sort of complicated bug reporting processes. If I had a really bad day, and you asked me to file a very detailed bug report about something that has just completely made me irate, I'm probably going to throw some very ugly words at you. And in, in, in retrospect, I will have regretted making those said, saying those words, but that's just in the moment we're very emotional people. So there's, I did some Googling for crisis intervention modeling and techniques and whatever, and it turns out a lot of them are, uh, are fairly well defined in terms of like best practices and what like that current recommendations for talking people down and helping them resolve problems. And uh, North Carolina has um, some crisis intervention stuff that's available online, and they have this this sort of mnemonic called LEAP, which is listen, engage, affirm, and partner. And you do that in all you do those four steps in that order. So you show that you're actively listening. You engage with the person and try and figure out what is going on, what's making them upset. You affirm that their problem is real, right? We get to the, we get back to the, the question of, or the statement of, this is not a real question. If someone is upset and you tell them the problem is not real, they're going to go ballistic. And then last thing, you part with them. This is not simply saying, okay, we've talked you down, we've calmed you down, you're back to being a, a normal, healthy human mentally. And now I'm just going to say, see that wall of text over there? Go read the entire thing and then come back and ask questions. Right? Now you're asking someone who's just finally gotten back to sanity and gotten back to a healthy mental state and tell them to read a 600 page document. And it's, they're just going to go back to being irate. So you, it's, it's important to partner with them. And, and I will acknowledge that you will not always have time or energy to partner with these people. Right? Partnering with these people is not necessarily part of your day-to-day -day job. You may not have the energy or the experience to enjoy doing this kind of thing. But if you have the option, this is the, I, in my mind, this is the best way to do it. So I mentioned this before, that text-based communication, there's no body language, no verbal cues. This makes doing uh, sort of this leap process very much more difficult because you can't see how they're feeling. The body is a very expressive thing. Even if, they're, if they've stopped talking, if they're silent, their body is still radiating information. Right? Where their eyes are looking, how they're walking, how they're moving back and forth, what their hands are doing, are they slouching? All of these things are informational cues you don't get over text. So some things that I, uh, I've said in the past to try and get people to sort of like recenter them, refocus them is that I say, I'm sorry Logstash is giving you a bad time, can I help? I like to say I'm sorry frequently to these kinds of users because I feel it gives some kind of ownership to me that something is something in their world is broken. If they're having a bad time with Logstash, I feel that it's fine for me to admit I wrote a lot of this software, it's probably my fault the bug is there, I can take ownership of you having a bad time. And now we've shared ownership. Right now, we're both going through this journey of solving this problem together, and you're not alone. I find saying, I'm sorry, is very important. You can also say something like this if you don't want to take ownership. And these, this is actually a fact. Computers are literally the worst things. Right? One of the, one of the sort of crises I, I think about frequently is that computer and software technology is actually is, is amazing and quite terrible simultaneously. Printers are a tragic pile of bad, and my phone mostly sometimes almost works, and my laptop never gets on Wi-Fi. 
There's all these things that should just work in, in theory, but oftentimes there's just reasons. We have, humans make these things and they just don't work sometimes. And so you just you just empathize or sympathize with that person. Ugh, computers are the worst. Let me see if I can help you. Even if you don't have time to help, you don't have to say that 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 I can help. Just say, just acknowledge that computers are crap. And you, I, I'm happy for you to tell everyone in the world that has having problems with Logstash that Logstash is a piece of junk. Because that will help them sort of recenter and go, oh yeah, you know, I have problems with computers every single day. This is not the first time. Another thing that, that I like to say is that's totally a bug. Right? This removes the burden of cause on the user. What I have found, especially from non-technical users, um, like my parents, for example, the bad computers, and that they're they're afraid of them. They're afraid of touching them in a way that that will make them fail. And it's not their fault that their their operating system keeps crashing, right? They they poked a button that was supposed to save a document, and the whole the whole machine blew up. That wasn't their fault, right? It's called just, it's called save. It's not called you know, new kind of machine. And so telling saying that you know that's that behavior that you're seeing from the software is not intended. It's a bug. Is a very powerful statement, and also following it up with, up, up with sort of paraphrasing, this is not your fault, right? You're in this situation because software has, has misbehaved, and it's not your fault. And it could just be a bug in the documentation. You might have been following a tutorial and it didn't work. It's not your fault, right? If the tutorial leads you down a path of failure, it's not your fault. It's a bug in the documentation. So something I like to do is a two-step process. One is part of kind of more rapidly de-escalating the crisis, which is offering a workaround. In some cases, this is, this is simply not possible. Maybe the bug is so entrenched that there is no possible workaround, or maybe there is it, it's too difficult to give the, 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 the context of the problem to how you can offer a workaround. But um, if there is no workaround, you can say, I'm sorry, I can't think of a workaround. And it's important to say, I don't know if there's a workaround, instead of say, saying something that sounds factual, which is, there is no workaround. Right? Because that leaves them, the user helpless. And that, try, that often documents what, what appears to be a fact. But really it is, I believe, this is the pre of the sentence again, I believe there is no workaround. And lastly, offering to document the problem in a ticket. And so my first encouragement for documenting the problem is asking the user to document the ticket. And that will depend on what I think their mental state is. And if they say, I don't have an account on GitHub, or I don't have an account to file a ticket, or I don't know how to file a ticket, I deal with the ticket system five days a week. Like, I can just type some stuff in and it's OK. So I don't mind filing tickets on, you, um, for, on behalf of users. The next story I want to talk about, and this, this piggybacks on what you can do once you de escalated a user is the rebound process. So just to, just to sort of recap, a human in crisis shows up in the community looking a bit like this, very angry. You have no context. All you know is they are furious. You don't know who they are. You don't know what their face looks like. You just know that their username is Foo Pants, and they are furious. And visually, it might look like this. They're setting everything on fire. So members of the community generally have two options. One, you can help resolve the crisis, or two, you can ignore, or even worse, inject the person in crisis. I do not recommend the second form. I always recommend helping this person. And if you help, you might find a magical thing happens. You will find that when the crisis is resolved, you'll find this human to be actually quite nice and pleasant. And in the best case, which, and I have no data on this, but anecdotally, it's quite, quite a, a, a number of people, is, once you have brought them back to being having a healthy mind state, you'll find that they actually stick around in the community and become great contributors. Some of the best contributors in the Logstash community showed up on their first day setting everything on fire and being furious, and the second day they came back and they were helping newbies. So they went from being completely angry and ready to blow up the world to helping new users in 24 hours. That to me is quite awesome. That's one of my favorite things is being sort of the steward of the Logstash community, is seeing this kind of thing happen, where you have someone come in who is very upset, and then you turn them around with a little bit, only a little bit of energy from, from myself or someone else, and 
they come back and they, they are now a productive and actually really great and useful uh, contributor to the community. And I say contributor because they may not code, again, code is not the only contribution. Hanging out on the IRC channel and answering questions, hanging out on the mail list or filing bugs or any of that stuff is a great contribution. They're all equal, equal to me. Another story I want to talk about is careers. So the Logs team is, is always growing um, by the last research. We're up to seven people now, um, always hiring more. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly significant change from where I was about a month, uh, a year and a month ago, where it was basically just me. And we had a lot of contributors doing IRC, email, ticket support, um, bugs, and code. But primarily, the, 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 the primary input to things in the project is myself. But now it's, it's seven folks working on it full time, which is quite amazing. Which allows me, for example, to go on vacation and the project still carries on quite, quite strongly uh, without my presence. One other thing that happens is that, you know, as you, if you were to start your life in the log test community as someone who's very angry at the project, and we manage to turn you around and you become a very happy person, there's a lot of jobs out there that are actually hiring for log test skills, and it's growing by like, quite a bit. So I think that to me is, is the second thing that I find most, uh, most fulfilling about having, having uh, stewarded the log test project is that it's actually providing people a way to live life. They can hopefully use a piece of software with a, with a, with a helpful and supporting community that allows them to make a living. And that's really amazing to me. And over the years, I have kind of codified um, some of the ways that we present kind of social norms in, in a way, or, or laws, as, as it were, in the law of session. One of which is, if you have a bad time, it's a bug. Right? This goes back into de-escalation. This goes back into software and computers are terrible. This goes back into, if a computer is failing, it's probably not your fault. At 3 a.m., if a hard drive fails, it's probably not just your fault. And so, I, I've said this for a number of years now, and if you take nothing else away from this, and you are active in other communities, I would really love it if this were like the mantra for all software. Like, if you have a bad time, it's a bug. Newbies having a bad time specifically is usually because of one of two things. One is a bug in the software, or there's a bug in the documentation. The third thing is they have royally screwed up. But why are they screwed up? Is it because the documentation is lying to them? How often have you been lied to by documentation? <laughs> Frequently. And the long stash docs, by, by far, are not perfect. There's, there's all kinds of mistakes. And I think. The, the best thing a, a community can provide is human-to-human -human contact, even if it's over text. Because a human being frustrated with not knowing what the next step is, looking at a wall of text is not going to help them. There is no super advanced artificial intelligence that is going to help them, as a human, figure out what to do next and understand context. But talking to another human, who may have been in your space before, is very, very useful. The next thing that we've kind of codified is that uh, there's kind of a three-step feature development cycle. The first step is kind of feeling it working, right? And this to me is the interface. What does the configuration look like? What does the UI look like? How are people going to use it? How does it feel when we use it? And once we have that, we're going to make it right by writing tests. Tests are important. I will admit that Logstash doesn't have as many tests as I would like, but frankly, what piece of software has a perfect test suite? I don't know. And then the third step is, is making it fast. And I think, in my mind, you have to do it in this order. Because if you do making it fast first, the interface has been forgotten, and the testing has been forgotten. And to know if you do make it right first, you forgot when you have designed the interface or how it's going to be used. And so you've written a bunch of tests with, it, with an interface that hasn't been planned. And so a, a number of the, it, most of the performance complaints about log testing been because of certain pieces of Logstash that are still in step one or step two, right? And I almost wait for people to say, why isn't this piece of Logstash fast enough? Then we know to make it go to step three. The last thing I would say is that if it doesn't do a thing today, we can make it do that thing tomorrow. The other way I say that is, it's a computer, we can make it do stuff. 
And from that point of view, if, if it's behaving in a, in a way that's contradictory to what you expect, either we should document that you're, how, how you, what you should expect, or we should add a new feature, or we should fix them up. And that the, the corollary to this is that if you see a piece of software behaving a certain way, it is easy to assume that it was intended to behave that way. And it may not be true. Humans are very mistake prone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about future stuff. Most importantly, I think I want Launchstash to have a code of conduct. I've seen a number of open source projects starting to adopt codes of conduct, and most, uh, more, even more frequently, I've seen um, conferences adopt codes of conduct, including uh, this one. And codes of conduct, I think, are, are, are important, in, in my mind, for, for, for even making it more open. You can have a house with no fence, and it's open. You can leave the door open, and it's logically it's open, but it's not inviting. I think to me, a code of conduct is inviting people who might not normally show up in your community to stop by because they might feel safer, because they know the expectations of certain kinds of behavior. And I, most specifically, I would love to proactively get a good code of conduct in the LogSash community. By proactive, I mean, I don't want to wait for something awful to happen to then react and say, now we need a code of conduct. Right? I think we have sufficient evidence in the technology industry that there are bad things that are going to happen, and we need to make these expectations set on what is okay behavior, what kinds of, of, of speech patterns are okay, how, how should you treat people, that kind of stuff. And again, this is for invitation. This is, you, you often see a sort of like a visceral and negative reaction to the idea of codes of conduct. If you are wondering why a code of conduct exists, that code of conduct is not for you. The code of conduct is generally for inviting people who might normally feel afraid or not welcome in certain communities. And I think for Logstash to fully be an open community, we have to have this sort of billboard that says, all are welcome and here's how. And here's how we enforce it. And groups like uh, the AI Initiative and also the Geek Feminism Wiki are also really great resources for finding out how you might come up with, an, with, a, with a great code of conduct for your communities. The next piece of future stuff, again, part of being part of code of conduct is we want to get uh, it, make it easier to get started contributing. I've had recently a number of users who say, you know, I want to start working on Launchdash by writing code, but all the documentation you have for developing is for Unix systems. I now run Windows. And I don't have an answer for that right now, but we should. And it should be easier to get started. We should make it easier for people to get their foot in the door so they can contribute in whatever way they wish. Let's see. So, so in summary, I think your, your community may appear difficult to navigate without things like a code of conduct, without without clearly documented norms or social norms or, or rules of engagement, your, your, what seems obvious and easy to navigate for you will look completely opaque, completely opaque and confusing to others. And also remember that as, as an as a open source contributor or simply as a, as a user or whatever role you decide to label yourself with, that there is life outside. And that if you see bug reports that have been open for 10 years, and maybe because there just hasn't been enough energy, there hasn't been that tipping point to say someone who can work on this must work on this. And also, don't point cannons at your community. Don't use sort of subjective labels like real, or that's not, that's an anti-pattern, or that's not idiomatic programming. Tell, explain why. Take the time to explain without using these sort of very subjective words that may be confusing and are, are, are actually very kind of put offish in rejecting of new longcomers. And don't say RTFM, because documentation everywhere is terrible. And the last thing I would reiterate again is that if a newbie has a bad time, it is a bug. And so, in conclusion, we are all in this together, so let's do it together. Let's do something else. Awesome.
Okay, we got some giveaways here. I'm going to do this really fast. I'm going to talk quick, and the stuff's going to fly. First thing we're going to give away right now is the Raspberry Pi B Plus. Um, yeah, we start off with something cool. Uh, Thomas O'Brien. Yeah. All right, we got uh, Justin Dow uh, Dowling. Dowling, Justin. Okay, it's a quote for you, buddy. Um, this is a BSD hats. Um, we got. Yeah, so whatever your name is called, just stand up and we're we'll running to you. Um, De David Reed. David Reed? Oh, keep going. Uh, all right, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Kelly Stinson. Hey, she's in the back. <laughs> Megan Fur. Dustin Cox. Dustin Cox. Uh, Lucas Allen, Joe Maraca, Edward Carter. If I call your name twice, take two books. <laughs> Darini, the side. Lucas Allen, Cesar Torres, John Orcus, <laughs> Kevin Orcus, Kevin <laughs> <Andrew> Orcus, <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Wilson, Chris Christopher Foley. Thank you. 